Good morning and welcome. I'm Bill Brown with Brookings Mountain West. Thank you for coming out on a Friday morning, especially. We will be respective of your time. I'm, one of my primary duties here will be gatekeeper to make sure our speakers uh, begin and conclude, <coughs> as our, our agenda says. Uh, we'll do very brief introductions. Uh, lengthier ones are on the back of your agenda. So if, if you have nothing better to do, you can memorize our biographies as time permits. Let me thank uh, a couple people. I would like to thank people up front and not as we're walking out the door. Uh, we're here in Greenspun College, so thanks to Dean Rob Elmer and his staff, Nicole Huckins, for helping us get this event started. And a special thanks to Caitlin Saladino of Brookings Mountain West and the Lindsay Institute. We would be standing in the parking lot not knowing what to do or where to go if she hadn't driven us and, and gotten this event off and going. We're here for a colloquium today. That's a term that's usually used in academia. Loosely translated, it means faculty addicted to PowerPoints. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> not really, but uh, it has some. You're going to hear uh, four presentations today. And the reason we gather to do these is uh, for the faculty to present their research, where they are, and wh where it might be going, what else might happen. And good research doesn't just create new information or new knowledge, but it also, many times, leads you to the next question. And so we'll be very curious to see what the next questions are that come out from this, because the, the research you're going to see is somewhat uh, a domino effect. We've asked our colleague Rob Lang to lay out and talk about uh, university land grants in, in the big picture. And that's a little more timely than we thought when we first proposed it. Uh, then we're going to hear from a colleague, Shannon Monat, who's going to lay out her research. And Shannon's uh, work was commissioned by the Lindsay Institute early in its uh, days here. Because if you're going to study nonprofits and help nonprofits, it was a good idea to know what are the nonprofits? How many are they? What areas are they in? How are they connecting to each other and to the community? So Shannon will lay that out. And her research led to David Damore's research on funding issues. And David has a lot of information on that. Uh, David's research then led to Fatma's research on best practices across the country. What are other states doing? What's Nevada doing? What might we learn from other states? Where do we go from here? So keep that in mind as we run through our events today. Let me try and get out of the way here with a uh, last comment that you'll see, again, a lot of PowerPoint slides, charts, tables, data. Do not give yourself carpal tunnel syndrome taking notes. They'll be up on our websites. Uh, uh, almost immediately after this, but very soon thereafter, if you miss a point of information, you'll be able to refer back to it. And as you can see, thanks to our colleagues in Greenspun College, th the entire event will be up on our website, and hopefully as soon as next week, we, when we get this edited and up. And we'll send announcements out about all that, so you'll get that information in a timely manner. So I now want to turn the event over to my colleague, Rob Lang. Is this the Good morning. Good turnout for an academic uh, colloquium. You know, usually I do these in departments and uh, brown bag with the grad students growling at you because it's like, you know, are we really going to have to learn all this stuff? Is this going to get in the tests and all that? So it is nice to see that uh, it is, uh, you know, so well attended on a Friday of all days. Uh, let me go back here, by the way. So my talk is the University of Nevada at Las Vegas, a land grant university. I want to point out that this is an early shot of the university, and it says the University of Nevada Southern Branch. And then there's modern UNLV. Now, I knew this school was always part of the University of Nevada because I saw Viva Las Vegas. And Elvis dances with Ann Margaret, and over his head, it says the University of Nevada. So when I took this job, I had been in other universities, and I thought I was moving to the University of Nevada. Not something called UNLV, but the University of Nevada at Las Vegas. So first, a disclaimer. This is true of all the talks. 
we're college faculty. We say things. Don't yell at the president. It's not his fault. He's a nice guy. He doesn't need any of this. He doesn't need the aggravation. So we're here to do that. We're here to say things that sometimes, you know, stir the pot a bit. And I think the state can handle it. By the way, this is uh, from Animal House. You see uh, Satan over here. This is Donald <coughs> Sutherland. This is Ben Stein. He's technically not a college professor, but I thought he looked very studious up there. So who am I? I am the executive director of Brookings Mountain West, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution back in DC. And most importantly, I'm faculty in this college, um, public administration. So I'm a professor of public administration or public policy or whatever the dean's calling it these days. Public uh, policy. Public yes. policy. Sounds even more vague. Public, <laughs> public administration sounds too practical. They had to fudge it up, make it policy. Okay. Now, my background is all land-grant universities, actually. Uh, I went to Rutgers University, which sounds private, but it's not. It was the State University of New Jersey. It is celebrating its 250th anniversary. It predates the land-grant era, because it's a colonial college, actually. But when the Morrell Act passed in 1862, and you'll hear more on that more specifically in a, in a moment, uh, when that was passed, the state had to qualify an institution. It's the state's <laughs> choice to which institution is qualified. Princeton competed for it, but they weren't as well-juiced in the legislature, so Rutgers got it. What's interesting is Cornell got it, too. So Cornell's an Ivy League school that has the ag college, that has ag and mechanical responsibilities for that. So I was, when I was at Rutgers too, the state mission was taken so seriously. The school I was in was so strong in the state mission uh, that the Port Authority in New York, New Jersey, now legendary because of the Christie stuff, you know, <laughs> the one that shuts bridges down that are the most important bridge in the United States. The Port Authority in New York, New Jersey gave Rutgers its building for urban planning and public administration. Uh, and it gave one to SUNY Stony Brook as well. It split it and made the two sort of universities uh, you know, relevant in that area because Rutgers was doing a ton of stuff, including what I was doing, is I worked on the state master plan, the state economic development plan. I was learning the urban geography of the state. I did uh, several Rutgers regional reports, and most importantly, the, the whole idea was that I was trained in the idea of a state mission. The whole point was I was trained in the academic work that is the applied social scientific work that intends to change the state's performance, that helps to lift the state. And then when I took a job at Virginia Tech, it is, G Virginia Tech's full name is Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. It is founded in 1872 as the state's land grant. And after, World War, uh, after the Civil War, rather, the South took these institutions seriously. It had lost the Civil War in part because it lacked the technology to sort of stand up to the North and Georgia Tech and Virginia Tech and institutions like that sort of took up the mantle. So the school was a, you know, a first-rate engineering school. Again, very serious about public outreach. I was department chair at one point. I ran a center there. Whenever I had to account for myself, and believe it or not, yes, the faculty are asked, what did you do this year? There was a section of it that was for land grants. You know, like, what were you doing for the public mission of the university? And it was taken seriously. In fact, if you failed in that, you got sort of called to task and asked to engage more thoroughly. And when I did grant work, I, of course, checked the box that we were a land grant because getting land grant status means you're qualified for more grant money. In fact, our libraries here, the consortium that they're in, require that we be a land grant. Were we not a land grant, we'd have to pay a kind of hefty entry fee for that unless we were Carnegie Research very high, which we're not and UNR is not either. So what is a land grant? Uh, according to the IPEDS data, which is the U.S. Department of Education. And it's really an institution that, based on these two acts in the 19th century, has been identified by the state as performing, and I guess military tactics. By the way, uh, Virginia Tech, at the center of it was a drill field. And it was serious in ROTC for a lot of years. Uh, in fact, people think it's VMI, the Virginia Military Institute. We used to get confused. We used to get mail for these guys. That's how confusing it was because of that history in the Morrell Act. But it's basically A&M, like Texas A&M, ag and mechanical, ag and mechanical. And the school was serious about both ag and mechanical. And again, the members of the working class need to obtain practical liberal education. So it was a, you know, meant to be an access institution. Now, UNLV, a land grant. Well, if you trust Henry Dickerson, who was the Harvey. attorney general at the time, Harvey, Harvey. pardon me. I know you knew him, right? 
I knew a Henry Dickens, Dickinson. <laughs> That's why I said that. It's Harvey. If you, well, you, how was Harvey? A nice guy? He was a great guy. He was a great guy. Well, Harvey had a rule in 1969, and here's the opinion, on the institution, and by the way, Jim Bilbray is sitting right here in front. He was former congressman, and he was a regent at the time, and I'm going to reference a moment when he was regent uh, in a moment uh, as I go through these slides, that there's a critical moment at the Board of Regents where the two institutions are put at equal status. But the University of Nevada system, consisting of all three schools, or rather two schools and the research institute, the Desert Research Institute, is the only land grant, and this is important. The components of the system may not hold individual grant sta uh, land grant status separate and apart from the system. The land grant is to the entire University of Nevada system. And what does the system office say? Well, you know, just over 10 years ago, just before it was called ENSHE, they said the same thing, that it applies to all units within the system based on their read of the best information. Now, let's contrast this state, Nevada, with Arizona and look at institutions within that state and why they are different than our experience. The University of Arizona was founded in 1885, this, when Arizona is a territory, it's a state in 1912. And when it's a territory, it picks two cities and two types of institutions to found at the same year. So it takes a land grant and puts it in Tucson. And by the way, Tucson wanted the state prison and got burned and they got stuck with the land grant. <laughs> That's true, it's a true story. I've spent some quality time as a, did a sabbatical semester at uh, ASU. And of course they told me all the Tucson stories like that. And then ASU was designated as the normal school, which is what we call a teacher's college today. I don't know why it was the normal school. I don't know historical uh, basis in what was normal in the late 19th century. But they were founded separately. The two schools grew up on parallel paths. The University of Arizona is the land grant. ASU is the teacher's college. Now today, both schools are comprehensive research universities. They're at the top tier of the Carnegie Endowments Classification System, or R1, which means they have heavy emphasis on research real high productivity in PhDs and all that, but ASU, despite all that, is not a land-grant university because it was separate. The University of Nevada, founded in 1874 as the state-designated land-grant, this school is a branch of it. In fact, didn't you have to complete your last year at first at UF? Absolutely. In fact, until 1964, you had to go up to Reno to get your bachelor's degree. You had to spend, originally, well, the, the deal was, I gave a little history, they, we promised we would be no more than a two-year extension. At two years, you had to transfer to Reno to get your other four. They finally dropped it to one year, but in 1964, we, we issued our first degrees from here. But it was all part of the University of Nevada. At first, it was the University of Nevada Southern Regional Division, and uh, then it became Nevada Southern with a dean, remember. Didn't have a president, had a dean was the dean for the Nevada Southern Division of the University of Nevada. So Las Vegas didn't have a separate institution. It wasn't designated, first off, it wasn't in the state at first, it was part of Northwest Arizona. So it had to get into the state after Arizona misbehaved during the Civil War, was on the wrong side of uh, the, the North, and then Nevada asked for and received water rights on the Colorado and grabbed this section of the state after statehood so UNLV wasn't sort of here, you know, Las Vegas didn't exist till 1905. It was never intent, intended that this be the state teacher's college. It was recognizing by the mid 20th century that sufficient population existed in the southern part of the state that it warranted a full on branch of the university, of the integrated university. Again, I'm in the University of Nevada. I'm a University of Nevada faculty member, comma Las Vegas. There's comma Reno. So then in 1969, and this is where Jim Bilbray is there, the Board of Regents has to decide what to do to graduate UNLV up to co-equal status. Does it become Nevada State? Does it become something else? Or is it just two co-equal branches? And the decision was? Two co-equal branches, definitely. Two co-equal branches. And in fact, the University of Nevada at Reno is told by the Regents who are, by the way, the Board of Regents of the University of Nevada. The Board of Regents of the University of Nevada tell Reno, you have to refer to yourself as the University of Nevada, comma, Reno, in all instances except sports and alumni relations. Those are your two exceptions. You're allowed to use the older term University of Nevada when you had exclusive franchise to that title. And the majority of Regents at that time came from the North. 
So the northern regions agreed to this too. It was a unanimous vote under this situation that we're talking about. So this is a unanimous vote, and this is one integrated system. Both schools are now Carnegie R2, attempting to get to R1. It would be good for them both to get there. The University of Nevada, and by that I mean comma Reno and comma Las Vegas, and DRI are actually the sole land grant institution. Uh, the University of Nevada is a single entity. Do not take my word for it. Consider the view of Regent Chair Rick Trachok. So he told in uh, 2015, November 8th, in the past we treated each of our eight institutions as separate legal entities, but we're a, se a single legal entity. That entity is Nevada's land grant institution. I'll say this too. So the federal government, they let a state designate a school, but they want it to be a four-year research-oriented university. They're not actually, at the moment, pleased with the state, based on email, uh, based on letter exchanges, we've seen that it has community colleges in its governance structure. That's a separate issue, but that's a, a key point here. But it doesn't matter, because the regents are, the, well, they're the state university regents. I hear they're NSHE regents. NSHE is the name of the system office. Okay, I was in Virginia, there was a system office called SHEV. It was the state higher education, blah, 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 blah. It was a system office for Virginia. It was in Richmond. It had 40 people. It had an executive director. The guy made 150 grand a year and was happy to get it. He had like an MBA or a master's in public administration. His specialty was, you know, coordination, compliance, intergovernmental relations, and the university presidents at Virginia Tech and the University of Virginia and William and Mary, that guy couldn't get him on the phone because they listened to their board of visitors who were their, essentially their regents. So when we see the system, I see the system <coughs> as being the state university system and the, the community colleges were added in, but that's a point for discussion, you know, because in most other places, of course, except for this state, Hawaii and North Dakota, they are under separate governance and they're local. See, they're called community <coughs> colleges. That's usually a hint that you're in a community so when it says state university, that's a statewide asset. So it doesn't surprise me that there are regions that are selected throughout the state that are governing a statewide asset that has three individual components within it, but have different locations and different faculties, but are all part of the same faculty. In fact, they're all part of the same legal entity, a single legal entity. If there's any land grant status in Nevada, then that single legal entity has that land grant status. So finally, co-op extension and land grants. So a university can be a land grant institution and not run co-op extension, which we don't run co-op extension, but we are a land grant. And by the way, if we ever weren't a land grant, you know, the state is an underperformer as far as sponsored research. I have a slide that I don't put up here, but I showed it yesterday in Reno that said that Mississippi's beating us. And I mean, it's not just beating us. Mississippi that has slightly more people, 100,000 more people, has a much smaller GDP, it has just over 100 million a year. Mississippi's gross domestic product is basically the size of Las Vegas without the rest of Nevada. The rest of Nevada in there, and yet Mississippi's got over $400 million in sponsored research. Together, UNR and UNLV only have $125 million in sponsored research. The point here is this. You don't want to disqualify any institution within this state that is legitimately, in the view of the federal government, a university-tiered qualified institution from you want it to receive la any land grant money, any rights of access to any form of federal aid that has formula basis, that has land grants getting a bump as a result of that formula basis. We have enough problems. If you asked us to not be this, and there is an issue of a previous employed person here uh, in the system who told us we were, were not a land grant despite all of this history, and you know, to create limbo on this, to have faculty not check in these grant applications our status is to reduce the effectiveness of this institution, to reduce the state branch and university in the largest metropolitan area in the state that's a principal driver of the economy and is not great public policy and I would think something that the state legislature would like to take up where they alerted to the fact that some part of this university system is being sort of you know, sat upon and told not to express a land grant status, which leads me to another final point here that I'm about to make. When I got to this university in 2010, I expressed, and I had a meeting with a person who I will not name, but was a very senior person in chief. And I sat down and I, I was very enthusiastic. And I said, my God, how great it is to be in another state U. I went to a state U, undergrad and grad. I taught at a state U, I was a full professor at a state U. 
I'm here at this other state U because I'm all about public mission. I'm in a public area. Public's in the title of my professorship. And I said, we've got this grant money from a good donor. We've got all this momentum. Let's charge at it. And he said to me, and we were up in the conference room upstairs, and he says, see Maryland Parkway over there? I said, the street? He said, look across the other side. Yeah, that's you and ours. Your mission is your campus. Because your faculty may not have the competencies to manage much more than that. A year later, I was one of the co-authors of the State Economic Development Plan. When this plan was conceived, pitched to the governor, and by the way, that's the plan that the state operates under to this moment. It's written by Brookings and SRI, it was one of three principal authors. When that plan was contracted, I was told that I have to take it as a private consultant. I had no anticipation of that. I expected to run that grant through the university. I'm like, you want the university to do it. If I was at Virginia Tech, they'd want the state, Richmond would want Virginia Tech to put its label on it. They'd want Penn State to put its label on it. They'd want Rutgers to put their label on it. No, I had to take it as a consultant because UNR would have to have a share of it. You think at Virginia Tech I was ever told the University of Virginia is gonna need a share of that? No one said anything like that. I never heard anything like that. So that state economic development plan is not credited to this university, despite the fact that this plan is out of this university. And this is the plan by which the state is operating economic development at this moment. So I find this situation sort of odd because I anticipated being a state university faculty member. I thought I was at a land grant institution. The attorney general says I'm a land grant institution. I'm in a land grant, the, you know, all evidence points to a land grant institution. But apparently I'm not. So, you have to be a land grant, you could be a land grant institution, not run co-op. However, you cannot run co-op without being a land grant institution, if you can follow that logic. At the moment, that's exclusively run by UNR, yet UNLV and DRI are eligible as equal partners in running co-op extension. And it's not a zero-sum game. There are more opportunities for partnership. You'll see this today. A lot of what you'll see today is that there is, you know, UNR has not fully expended the revenue that Clark County taxpayers have put up for co-op extension. It is not programmed the full amount that it could have. And that I think UNLV and DRI could bring new energy and skills and resources and faculty into this mix. And you know, UNLV is already a land grant institution, has extensive community engagement, which you'll see in a moment. So from my two centers, I'd like to engage. I think the dean's over here, and you know, he's, I've shown his college. I'm sure that you know, all of us would like to engage, and I think you'll see models around the country where anybody who's at a branch of a university within another state system who's a local faculty member is not been locked out of the building, which is something that actually literally happened to us when we attempted to use the building. You were there when we were locked out of the building. They are, and this is a county building, and this is paid for by county taxpayers. They are usually the people on the ground local that have the information about that region because it's hard to phone in from 400 miles away. The information necessary to manage a complex two million, plus, two million plus person metropolis that we have here from a smaller space. They don't try it in Columbia, Missouri. They don't try it in, you know, they don't try it in other parts of the country because they know that if there's a branch at the University of Missouri at St. Louis, that that faculty probably has a read on St. Louis. You cannot believe the kind of read that this faculty has on Las Vegas. You cannot believe the extent of our engagement with this community. And we can show that empirically. This is an academic setting, so when I say that, that's not an impressionistic view. That is a statistical view that's verifiable. So when I say this, I say, you know, we are qualified. I think we have the competencies. I think that the college that I'm in is one of the most indispensable institutions to the state, and that it wants to be further engaged, that it wants to help lift this state, that we've helped lift this state. And I'd like to see the university finally get recognized for doing this sort of stuff. I don't know why it's still Nevada Southern Branch when you know, all appearances are that whatever competencies we have, and we've looked, we have actually more Ivy Leaguers teaching in our school. We have more people from universities like mine, which is a high performing public university. So don't tell me that we lack the competencies, that we don't have the skill set to do this. I think that's a misnomer, thank you.
everybody. My name is Shannon Monnet, and I am currently an assistant professor at Penn State University. Uh, like Rob, I am completely state educated. I got my first degree at a community college in upstate New York, Jefferson Community College. And then I got my bachelor's degree at the State University of New York at Oswego, and I got my PhD at the State University of New York at Albany. And since that time, I have been entirely employed by state universities. First, I spent five years here at UNLV, and now I've been at Penn State for three years. And so, like Rob, I also have this sort of commitment to public education and a view that it's really important to the economic and social and political well-being of the states and, and the country as well. And so what I want to do today is talk to you a little bit about a project that I was commissioned to do when I was a faculty member here at UNLV, uh, which was a nonprofit network analysis of the health, education, and social service nonprofit organizations here in Southern Nevada. And I'd like to start just by acknowledging uh, the Lindsay Institute for funding the project and also several collaborators that I had on the project, many of whom are here in this room. Uh, and so I had some assistance from a graduate student in my department, Department of Sociology. Fatma, who is here, uh, helped a lot with providing technical assistance and uh, writing a brief, which you can find on the Lindsay Institute website if you want more information and details about the methods or the motivation for this study or the you know, details about the findings themselves. And then several of the Lindsay Institute scholars uh, worked with me to help to identify the, the sort of overall population of nonprofit networks to which we could approach with, with a survey um, and, and to try to get more information about their connections here in Southern Nevada. Okay, so you know, what was the background, what was the motivation of this? This was not intended at all to be a study of UNLV or to be a, a study of cooperative extension. The sole motivation was to try to identify the network of nonprofit organizations here in Southern Nevada under the view that, that like other places, the economic, social, health, and, and demographic challenges that are facing Nevada are complex. They're often dynamic, they're interrelated, and as such, they require a coordinated approach, a cooperative approach, uh, to try to best utilize the resources that are available to us here in this state. And this is especially important, I think, under conditions where funders want to see more collaboration, uh, more cooperation among different organizations. When thinking about this from a cooperative extension framework, we know that the hallmarks of cooperative extension are really about openness and accessibility and cooperation and the idea of, of putting knowledge to work in pursuit of economic vitality and uh, economic sustainability and social well-being. And so as part of this, the idea of connecting local experiences and uh, research-based solutions, connecting those two things together to help families and to help communities thrive is, is really at the, the foundation of the mission of cooperative extension. Okay, so um, I liked this map. This is from Cornell Cooperative Extension in New York, my, my home state. And I think that mission, that cooperative extension mission, the idea of connecting uh, and collaborating is really highlighted nicely in this map where you can see that cooperative extension in New York State has a presence all the way from the most rural to the most urban parts of the state with, with no part of the state really left behind. And I can tell you from my experience of living there that that, that is true, that is accurate, that yeah. if you go to any county in New York State and ask them if they know what Cornell Cooperative Extension is, people would know that they have that kind of a presence. And the organizations in those counties in New York would know what Cornell Cooperative Extension does and what its mission is and that it's there to connect and collaborate. So the objectives of this study that uh, we conducted in 2012 and 2013 were to try to identify the, the structure of nonprofit health, social service, and education organizations in Southern Nevada with a particular emphasis on trying to identify the organizational leaders uh, the nonprofit leaders. So again, this was not intended to be a study of UNLV or cooperative extension in and of themselves, but was, it was really far broader than that. Um, and so we wanted to identify the agencies that sort of make things happen, right? The agencies that act as bridgers or brokers, the agencies that coordinate activities uh, and cooperate and extend information and knowledge out into the community, because these are really the brokers of change. They're the organizations that 
uh, create economic development, facilitate that development, and promote well-being in communities through their positions as intermediaries or bridgers. So just to tell you a little bit about the data and methods that we use for this study, this was a web-based survey that was administered to leaders of nonprofit organizations. So these were people like executive directors uh, or complement complementary to those, those folks. Uh, and so we worked together, uh, Lindsay Institute scholars and myself and members of the nonprofit community worked together to design this survey, to design the, the study plan. We conducted pre-survey focus groups with several nonprofit leaders in Southern Nevada to make sure that the questions that we were asking would make sense to the people who were taking the survey. Uh, we identified a pool, a potential pool of 460 health education and social service nonprofit organizations through various means. And then we attempted to get contact information from all of them through all kinds of means that, that you can imagine. So the Lindsay Institute purchased a list from the National Center for Charitable Statistics. I searched on websites, I went to LinkedIn pages, I went to people's Twitter pages, I went to Facebook, I went to organizational websites, any mechanism that we could find to try to identify uh, phone numbers or emails or information about these organizations so that we could send them a survey. So after months of effort of doing that, we were able to obtain contact information for 390 of them. Uh, we did a pilot survey to make sure everything was working correctly, and then we disseminated the survey in 2012 and 2013 to these 390 organizations. We got 298 surveys back, and then we were able to analyze those data using social network analysis. And so the, the opportunity that social network analysis really provides for us is that we can visually map the connections between organizations in Southern Nevada. We can not only map it, but we can empirically measure and analyze those relationships to identify which organizations are most connected and how are those organizations connected. So what I'm gonna do is provide you with some information both about the overall structure of the nonprofit network in Southern Nevada and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the individual positions of both UNLV and Cooperative Extension in this network. Okay, so what we can do with this is sort of identify the overall cohesiveness of the network and identify the leaders in the network. So in terms of the survey content, before I show you some results, what we did was ask the respondents to identify up to 20 nonprofit organizations with which they were most connected. We said that these could be private or public but that they were supposed to be health, education, or social service nonprofit organizations. And then we provided a whole list of the different ways that they could be con connected and asked them to check all of those ways that they were connected with these organizations. And then there was an option for them to add if there were additional um, ways in which they were connected. So then we created a matrix in Excel, which as you can imagine was a huge table of all the organizations in the columns, all the organizations in the rows, and we had check marks every time that each one was connected with another. So it's this massive matrix in Excel that can then be used to create a visual map of the connections. So what I'm going to show you now uh, is what's called a sociogram. It's a graphical representation of the connections in the Southern Nevada nonprofit network. It's really, really large, so the sociogram is gonna look really confusing uh, and complex and cluttered. You don't have to pay attention to all of those connections. It's just to try to give you a sense of how big this network is and how many connections there are. So just sort of take in the magnitude of these connections. Yeah, it's big, right? It's a little overwhelming. When I saw this, I was like, how the heck am I gonna make any sense of this at all. So this is, this is the sociogram, it's the network map, and it identifies the connections between all 461 of the organizations that were identified in the surveys as organizations that other organizations were connected with. The red colored circles identify um, the private nonprofit organizations, the blue are the government nonprofits, the pink are funders, and the green are faith-based organizations. You can see that the private organizations really represent the, the largest proportion, or largest share of organizations within Nevada, the UNLV's, uh, Southern Nevada's nonprofit network. The size of the circles 
represent the number of ties or number of connections. So larger circles mean that that organization has more ties with other organizations than those with smaller circles. Okay, so um, we can really see that among the organizations with the, the largest number of ties, we have UNLV, uh, United Way, Three Square, the Clark County School District, Help of Southern Nevada Catholic Charities. So these are the organizations in the Southern Nevada Nonprofit Network with the most connections with the, the most ties. So we can sort of identify collaborations or the degree of connections among organizations based upon statistics that we can draw from these network maps. Okay, so this is the network as a whole, but we can glean statistics from it. So for instance, the average number of ties in the Southern Nevada Nonprofit Network is just over 10. It's partially an artificial number because if we had asked organizations to identify more than 20, then the average might have been higher. If we had asked them to identify fewer than 20, then the average might have been lower. But because we asked them all to identify up to 20, we asked them all to identify the same number, that means we can compare organizations to each other, right? They all had an equal chance to say how many, uh, and other organizations had an equal chance to choose them as one of the organizations to which they were connected. Because of the very large size of this network, it would seem, it would appear as though it's very dense, but it's actually not. It's actually a very loose network. The density score, which is a measure of network cohesiveness, is only 2.2%. That's very low. It's partly due to how large it is. Uh, it's harder to have all of the organizations connected when it is so large. But it also represents that there's a lot of opportunity for building more connections, for increasing collaboration in Southern Nevada. There, there's a lot more room left for more organizations to be co connecting and collaborating to each other. So we can also map each, individual's or each individual organization's connection with each of the others to whom they're connected. So this is what's referred to as an ego network. Uh, and it's really understood as the roles and the positions of individual organizations within the overall network. Uh, and why that's important is that because the position of the organization in the overall network can tell us a lot about the opportunities or the possibilities of that organization to be important in driving what's happening in the overall network. The roles that those organizations can play in being brokers or mediaries or collaborators. So organizations that score the highest on several key, member, uh, several key measures in this, non, this network analysis are considered to sort of be the most active, to be the most cooperative, to be the most influential within the overall system. So this is UNLV's ego network. Each of these organizations are connected to UNLV in some way, either as identified by them, mostly as identified by them, right? Because remember, organizations can only list up to 20 to which they were connected. So UNLV could have listed 20. But the fact that there are so many more than 20 indicates that lots of other organizations said that they were connected to UNLV in their list of, of the possible 20. So there are a number of different ways to describe an individual's organization Im importance within this network. And the first and most common measure that we use in network analysis is called degree centrality. So this is simply the number of immediate ties or connections that the organization has within the overall network. And it's viewed as a measure of the level of involvement of that organization or activity in the network. And it characterizes the extent to which this organization can be considered a major channel for information. So organizations with high degree centrality are involved with many other organizations in the network. And thus they have the potential to obtain information really quickly and disseminate that information really quickly. So of all the organizations in this study that were identified, UNLV ranks first in degree centrality. They had the most connections of all of the organizations that were identified. And just to sort of compare across the top 10 in the Southern Nevada Nonprofit Network, we see that UNLV ranks first by far. Then there are another, a, a number of large private nonprofit organizations and some public nonprofit organizations listed in here as the top 10. Just to give you a sense of the range of the very most connected organizations within the network. Okay, and so again, this measure represents cooperation, it represents activeness in the network, and it represents extension and the ability to extend within the network. 
It's also important to be connected to the right organizations in the network. And what I mean by that is that an organization increases its ability to obtain information and resources if it's connected to other organizations that also have a lot of connections within the network. And so um, we can think about this as sort of like a childhood friendship network. Uh, if you are friends with somebody else who has a lot of friends, that sort of increases your popularity within the friendship network, right? Uh, and so why is this important from the perspective of the nonprofit field? Well, let's think about um, a new nonprofit organization that comes onto the scene. It would be in the best interest of the executive direct director of that organization to get to know as much as possible and to get to know the players of the other nonprofit organizations in the network, right? That puts them in a better position to be able to understand what's going on, to be able to compete with, for funding, and so it would take a long time for that individual executive director to reach out individually to all of the nonprofit organizations in the network. The nonprofit director might be more efficient and effective at doing that if it connected with another organization that already knew and was connected with a lot of other organizations in the network. Does that make sense? So then in that case, UNLV is the type of institution that a new executive director, a new nonprofit would want to connect with because it has so many connections with other organizations. So on this measure, which is referred to as eigenvector centrality, UNLV ranks second in the network. In addition, where an organization is positioned within the network is really important. So an organization that is situated between disconnected organizations, organizations that currently aren't working together at all, can serve as a bridge organization, a broker, an intermediary. Um, and so this type of measure is, is referred to as betweenness centrality. And research indicates that betweenness centrality best captures the most important actors in the network. And on this measure, UNLV ranks first. If this type of an organization was removed from the network, it would lead to major disconnections. And in, in the, the most extreme case, it could lead to a collapse of the whole network. Now, obviously, that's not what's going on here. But in network analysis, that's what this measure represents. Finally, closeness centrality emphasizes an organization's, uh, an organization's ability to quickly mobilize, to bring groups together in the network because they can more easily and quickly reach out to each of these other organizations. Researchers have linked this measure, this idea of closeness centrality, with the ability to have power and influence over the network. And on this, UNLV ranks second in the whole network. OK. So now I just want to show you a comparison of the average scores in the network on these four different measures that I just told you about to UNLV scores and to cooperative extension scores. So the first column is the measure. The second column is the implication of that measure. What is it that it's actually assessing? The third column is the average. The fourth is UNLV score, which you just saw. And the fifth column is cooperative, cooperative extension score. Um, and so the implications of this are that on every measure, UNLV ranks really, really high. And on every measure, cooperative extension is maybe not doing so well, not meeting its full potential. And so UNLV is in a really strong position to be able to cooperate, extend information and services, access new ties, bridge and, and broker relationships between other organizations, and mobilize action. So based on information about all of the organizations in the study, and some characteristics of those organizations. So things like the age of the organization, the number of employees they have, their budget, the types of services that they, that they provide. We can use regression analysis to estimate what the scores should have been or should be on each, or on each of these measures for every organization. And so I did that. I used information about the organization to predict what each of these centrality scores should be based on that information. And in each case, what I found was that UNLV overperformed on its predicted centrality measure. So for instance, the regression model predicted that UNLV should have a, a, a degree centrality of 23, but it actually has a degree centrality of 97. Okay, so way overperformed based on its age, its budget, its number of employees, and the types of services it provides. 
Cooperative extension, on the other hand, on each measure, underperformed. So for instance, the model predicted that it should have a degree centrality score of 25, but it actually has a degree centrality score of 4. So what are the implications of the characteristics of Southern Nevada's nonprofit network for cooperative extension? Well, this shows you the breakdown of the age of the organization and the number of employees, sort of size measure of the organization. And what this tells us is that the Southern Nevada nonprofit network is really young, right? Most organizations started um, after the 19, 1980s, okay? And we have about 48% that have only been around since 2000. So it's a very young network for one. And the other is that the size of the organizations in the network are very small. Over half of the organizations in the network have 10 or fewer employees. And that's important, being young, and being small means that the network, the organizations in the network need more help in order to bridge and cooperate and collaborate. They need the existence of a strong presence, of a strong bridger and broker within the community to help them collaborate and cooperate and extend. We also asked respondents what they perceived to be the greatest barriers to collaboration within the network. And so you can see here, these are the top two that were, that were identified, the greatest barrier and the second greatest barrier. And these have to do with time constraints, vision, uh, resources, sort of competition for resources, lack of knowledge about good partners, and problems with, with leadership within each of the organizations. And so um, respondents also provided quotes, and I'm just going to highlight a few here for you. The, the barriers that were reflected related to funding and resources were that really the nonprofits here are, are sort of underfunded and understaffed. And that too many agencies are worried about covering staff resources in a way that it's really difficult for them to collaborate together on projects. Related to knowledge and training, there was this sentiment that there are really good people doing important services within Southern Nevada, but that they might not just have the skills or the knowledge uh, or you know, the marketing skills to be able to meet the, the existing needs and that there was this sentiment that they would really like some workshops and some trainings uh, on things like getting grants and how to apply for funding and how to evaluate existing programs. When it comes to community planning, there were sentiments about how they just don't know each other that well, that there need to be more common communication forums, that there would be, uh, if there were opportunities for discussing services and opportunities for collaboration with other nonprofit leaders, that would be really beneficial to them. And I tell you these things because I think that each of these perceived barriers could be targeted either directly or indirectly through strong cooperative extension programming. And so I'm going to give you some examples from Penn State because that's what I'm familiar with, but there are similar examples from Cornell cooperative extension as well. And so, for instance, if you go onto Penn State's Cooperative Extension webpage, what you'll see is a whole array of workshops on, and courses that get at the very barriers that some of these nonprofit leaders were identifying. Things like grant writing and managing volunteers to try to leverage the existing resources that you have. Your resources might be small, but if you can get a pool of volunteers, then that can help provide services. Facilitating effective communication, understanding economic change, these are all workshops that are available uh, through Penn State Cooperative Extension. Uh, another example from my own department is the Better Kid Care uh, program, which is professional development for early care and for youth development professionals so that they can improve quality of care. So this is about increasing knowledge and skills through training. The PROSPER program is really cool because it's led by community teams that are made up of representatives from Penn State Extension but also from other nonprofits all around the, the state. And so these are school district personnel, they're representatives from community service agencies, their parents, their youth, their other community members. And it's a very collab uh, collaborative, cooperative program that brings evidence-based prevention programs to schools to try to build resilience and reduce substance abuse and other problem behaviors. Okay, so to summarize, um, what this study showed, without it being its original intent, was that UNLV is really, really central to the Southern Nevada nonprofit or uh, nonprofit network. 
And that is evidenced by scores that indicate really strong participation, really strong influence in the community, access to information and resources, and the ability to mobilize other organizations. And for me, what this suggests is that the Southern Nevada Nonprofit Network could really extend its reach and could extend its impact with the help of strong cooperative extension presence, uh, with strong cooperative extension programming that focuses on what appear to be the main barriers out of the mouths of nonprofit leaders, training and development, maximizing existing resources, whether it be personnel or financial resources or time issues or volunteers, promoting evidence-based services and programs, and sort, sort of serving as a hub for strategic planning and for connecting different organizations. Thank you. Hello, thanks for coming out. Uh, my name is David Damore. I'm a uh, faculty member over in political science. I'm also a uh, fellow here at Brookings Mountain West here. Um, my bio has my background and some of my research interests, but like Shannon and Rob, I too, all my degrees come from uh, state universities as well. Um, and just a little background on how I ended up uh, working on this project is when I first started my career, I was very interested in national level politics. But after getting tenure, I kind of took a step back and realized, you know, the federal government doesn't do anything anymore. It's kind of broken. There's not much to study. And most of the research was basically focusing on why the government's broken. Um, but when you get to state and local government, it's a very, very different picture. Very, very, very bri bri vibrant, right? They have to actually balance a budget, right? They have to go back and live in their constituency, live with their constituents, and live with, of course, um, the decisions and the policies they're implementing there. So that's what got me interested in studying state and local politics. And really since tenure to being promoted to full professor, everything I've done has been pretty Nevada related here. So the framing I use for a lot of my research on Nevada is what we call political economy here. And this is a uh, approach to studying politics that basically focuses on how politics, we can define in terms of policy, institutions, governance structures, and the values that are imbued in those and that maintain them, and how those affect economic outcomes, and ultimately in the case of, of government, overall social well-being here. Now, in the case of Nevada, we also have to consider geography. As Rob mentioned in his talk, right, this was not part of Nevada when the state was originally founded. So the creation of state government is 450 miles away from here. Right? It's staffed by people who are not largely from Southern Nevada. Right? In fact, we did some analysis of this, and outside of Health and Human Services, Southern Nevada's the number of state employees across the, the various departments is very, very small in Southern Nevada compared to in Northern Nevada. And so this just reflects the state's history here. So I've used this uh, basic approach to study lots of different things uh, related to Nevada politi politics and policy, transportation, the legislature, K through 12, um, and higher ed funding, which I'll talk about here in a minute, some of, the, some of the work I've done there. So what sort of informs my expectations about studying Nevada and Nevada politics here is the first is Clark County is very, very different from the rest of Nevada. And all you have to do is get on 95 and drive north and you quickly realize as you leave Clark County that, oh boy, um, very, very big space, not a lot of people out there, not a lot of urbanization out there, very different economies, very different demographics. Um, so we all know that if you've taken the, the drive on 95 there. Um, second is Nevada is basically run like it's still the 1800s. Um, that most of our governance institutions, of course, were not designed for a large, diverse, urban metropolitan state, and just so you have a sense of how urban Nevada is, we are the third most urbanized state in the, in the country, and soon we will be a majority minority state. A very, very different Nevada than when most of our governance structures are, were created there. And this, of course, is a basic social science argument here is that institutions shape outcomes. If you have institutions that don't reflect your state's needs, you're going to have ineffective policy here. And just to give you a sense of this, right, we end up in Nevada, we're one of four states that has a part-time legislature. We're the only state where the governor gets to pick road projects. We're one of three states that put our community colleges and our universities together. 
Sadly, we still use a funding formula for K through 12 that, of course, was created in the 1960s. Um, so just to get a sense how antiquated we are, the sort of reform movements that swept across the country in the 60s, 70s, never really took root here. Um, so as a consequence here, Clark County is just very, very different in the structure of government doesn't really, isn't designed to reflect, reflect that. Now, cooperative extension is interesting because it also brings up federalism issues. Right, Rob mentioned some, some work we've done, uh, some other Lindsay folks have done looking at the relationship between Nevada and the federal government. Nevada does very, very poor in getting resources, does a poor job in getting resources from the federal government, much lower than our expected share across a broad range of policy areas there. And of course, Nevada is a Dillon's rule state, which means that local governments really have no autonomy. The only authority they get is what the state is willing to give them. Um, so that's been a, a big tension, particularly in southern Nevada, where if you ever go to the Nevada legislature, you'll realize quickly that they're not only doing state business, but they're doing all the local government business as well in 120 days every two years. So, just some context for you there, right? So, fed, uh, so my, my, my role today is to talk about the, the funding side of this. So, Cooperative Extension largely draws from three sources, federal funding, and I'm not going to talk too much about that. Um, State funding, and this is money that comes out of the state general fund, and again, the state general fund is largely funded by economic activity in southern Nevada. About 80 plus percent of all the dollars that uh, are in the state general fund come from here. Um, and of course, the county, right, for cooperative extension comes from property tax. NRS code says, establishes this rate that it's one cent for every $100 of taxable uh, property you have. And since we have some of those valuable properties in Nevada about a mile from here, you can imagine, as we'll see here in a minute, the amount of property tax that comes out of southern Nevada here. In terms of the infrastructure, that is the physical buildings here, obviously you have the county finance the buildings. We'll talk about that in a moment here. And as Rob mentioned, the Morrell Act, which created the actual physical land grants um, there as well. And I'll speak to that in, my con in the conclusion. Now, if you've ever waded into the Nevada budget documents, you quickly, your head starts spinning. Um, and I've done a lot of this, so I'll break it down for you. And I actually have a whole paper that we wrote after for Lindsay after the, uh, the, the revisions to the funding formula. So if you want to understand that and you want to run the, the interaction between formula and non-formula budgets, I'll refer you to that on the Lindsay webpage here. But we largely spend most of our time talking about the formula budgets, and that's the, uh, what allocates the uh, budgets, the operating budgets, the state support for the seven teaching institutions. And then there's another section called non-formula budgets, and these are essentially line items for the professional schools and DRI. Uh, the athletic programs at UNLV and UNR, statewide programs, which I'll talk about here in a minute, NCHI administration, uh, which when you put it all together is nine different budget lines, they get about 35, $31 million annually, which of course is more than three of the institutions that they're governing get. Um, Ag experiment station, health laboratory, and then of course, cooperative extension. Um, so if we take a look at this, and this is for 2016-17, uh, and this comes from the appropriations report um, that was put forth by the LCB after the budget closed after the 2015 session um, in June of that month, in June of 2015 here. We see here that formula sucks up most of it, 73% of the higher ed budget here, about $400 million. Then you have the professional schools, which get a combined $81 million, the other formula lines, and then you see cooperative extension, about 1% of the state's budget. Um, in terms of the higher ed budget there. So not a lot, and I'll show you some data here in a minute to show you how that's changed over time. Um, now if we look and we break this down and you go into the uh, uh, operating budgets for ENCHI and they break down uh, where this money gets spent here, you'll see that uh, most of the state money goes into Northeast Central, and those used to be two separate areas, and now they've been combined here. About two-thirds of that, or 55%, goes there. Again, Clark County, with 75% of the state's population, roughly, ends up getting 36% of the state money comes down here. And then the bottom uh, pie table tells you that how the FDE gets distributed. That is the state line where the state's paying for cooperative extension employees um, here. And I'll show you the county data here in a little there. Um, now, if you look at this, Right, this is going back and tracking about the last 10 years of state and federal money that gets reported in the appropriations reports um, that are, again, put, put out by LCB here. The federal share, um, according to these data, stayed pretty constant here. And then you'll see what happens on the state share. Right? So way back in those 
boom days of the early last decade, right? A lot of money flowing in, into cooperative extension there, right? So you end up, of course, over time, that gets cut, that gets cut as the higher ed budget's getting cut, as revenue becomes uh, scarce there. That higher ed takes big, big budget hits throughout this period here. But you'll notice there's a very, very large drop here, right? Basically, it goes from uh, 6.2 million to 3.4 million. So, what happened here? And this is an interesting story. Um, so, you have to go back and look at the 2011 appropriations bill. Um, and what they did in that, for that bill, and this is again, we have a two year budget cycle, so this is for two years. They, what they did is they consolidated the higher ed budget lines. So, usually, Every budget line is a separate account. If you want to move money between them, you have to go to IFC, and I'll tell you what that is in a minute if you don't know. But for the 2011, they basically consolidated everything, put it all in one big pot. And what this did, it allowed the Nevada system of higher education to move budgets and money between different budgets accounts, right, without having to go to IFC. Now, IFC is another one of these only in Nevada things. Um, since we only have a legislature that meets every two years, but shockingly, government needs to do business for more than 120 days every two years, they've carved out something called the Interfinance Committee. And these are people who, uh, it's about a third of the legislature, maybe a little bit less, who have been given the power to essentially adjust budgets after the fact. Is it constitutional? Well, it's Nevada. Um, <laughs> so... What happens here, and this, did, again, this doesn't go, this is just NG acting unilaterally here, right? We see cooperative extensions budget gets cut as this money moves around in the paper I re referenced earlier, has all this, the, these, the, these changes in there. And then you see a commensurate increase in UNR's statewide programs budget. Now, for those of you not familiar with statewide programs, this is a Raggio era creation. Um, which was designed essentially to take money out of the pool available for everybody, all seven institutions to compete for their operating budgets. You essentially carve out money for various programs um, on the UNR campus and then subsequent on the UNLV campus, right? And if you look at what these programs are, it's a real mismatch of, mismatch of things. There's stuff that's there one year, the next year it's not. There's different categories there and so on and so forth. So, you know, you can get a sense of what I think of statewide programs. But um, if you look at the, uh, the paper again, I talk about this in more detail here. So since that time, what's happened, though, is those changes that came about in the, because of the 2011 budget have been carried forward. So cooperative extension has been dealing with about 3.4 to 3.7 million in state funding. UNR statewide program has gone up between to about $8 million now. Now, if you go dig into the uh, NG uh, self-supporting, oh, this is the operating budget there, you will see that part of UNR's statewide programs budget is now appropriated for UNR's quote-unquote Southern Office of Prospective Students. So this is their recruiting office. So let's think about this. You took money out of cooperative extension, you then put it in statewide programs, you then put in the recruiting office as a statewide programs appropriation instead of paying that out of student registration fees or something like that. And then of course when you Google in the address for that, it is housed in the Cooperative Extension building, right? which of course is paid for by Clark County taxpayers there. Now if you're looking for a comparison, UNLV statewide programs are between 2.8 and 3.5 million. And I think this goes to Rob's point about how UNLV is not seen as a statewide institution here, despite its equal status there. Now, if we project this based upon enrollments of Nevada system, or excuse me, Nevada citizens, essentially UNR ends up with 3.2 times greater statewide programs funding than does UNLV. Now, if we take a look at the county appropriations over time here, this is kind of a, this is actually the uh, cleaned up, less cluttery version of this. Um, so the bottom line, the bottom data are the annual, and these are the expected estimated property taxes that come from the Clark County budget. So I went into the Clark County budgets and looked up the cooperative expansion here, and then they have what they think is estimated cash on hand, Right, that is leftover revenue that wasn't spent there. And then you have to go two years 
forward and then look back in the budgets to see what the actuals were, right? So there's a, usually a little bit of difference. And just to note, the Clark County budget assumes that cooperative extensions funding will be spent down every year, but as you see, it's not. There's averaging about a $10 million surplus in the cooperative extension budget or uh, uh, account for Clark County here. Now, one of the stipulations on this county funding for cooperative extension is it can only be spent in Clark County. So each cooperative extension in each county that they fund those operations and that money, that part of those budgets can only be spent in those counties here. So this obviously raises an interest, a number of interesting questions, but the first is if you have more money than you wanted or you expect it to have, what do you do with this? So one thing that they have done with this extra money here was essentially pay down the bond debt for the building at Windmill and 215 here. So this was uh, originally, uh, the bonds were issued in 2004 for $10 million, right? But because of the rise in property values and the growth in Southern Nevada, lots and lots of re that extra revenue I showed you a moment ago here, right? So in 2009, the Board of Regents moved to move $5.5 million, $5 million in surplus to, uh, Pay down some of the pay down some of the, the bond debt there, and over the course of the life of the bonds, that should save uh, at the time the projections were 3.3 million dollars. Um, now, what was it caught my eye when I was digging through these documents is a couple of quotes in the report that comes from the Board of Regents of the University of Nevada's Business and Finance Committee at the December 3rd, uh, 2009 BOR um, meeting. So, yeah, I spent a lot of time on on that. Uh, on that one. So the first one says, sort of justifies this, right? So fiscal years uh, 05 to 08, substantial increases in property values in Clark resulted in some substantial increases in revenue from University of Nevada Cooperative Extension in Clark County here. Cooperative Extension does not believe or did not believe that these increased valuations of revenue were sustainable. So it ar argued for essentially taking this and paying down the debt, right? But as we know from the data, right, we're still seeing these surpluses in the Cooperative Extension uh, budget there again roughly 10 million dollars a year here now what's interesting here I thought was the second part here is the early savings and reduced debt service that's at 3.3 million that should be saved over the life of the bonds will be used to expand cooperative extensions educational programs in Clark County without requiring additional state funding here so this was sort of seen as an opportunity to expand programming but again we see that surplus there and of course we know now that they're actually doing recruiting for UNR out of the county-owned Clark County building that's housed as cooperative extension as well. Um, so we have that going on there. Um, this is if you break down the salaries here, um, and this again comes from the NG self-supporting budgets here, you see uh, the difference between the, the total salaries for classified and the number of county employees at cooperative extension of Clark County that's paid with the county funds, um, and then the professionals there as well. Um, on that one there. So you're basically employing, you know, roughly 55, 60 people um, through this county, through the county money at Cooperative Extension, on top of, of course, the state lines as well. That, that I'm looking at that separately here um, on this one here. Now, returning back to my points um, that I started with here. So is Clark County different from the rest of Nevada? Yes, it is, right? Economic activity in Clark County generates the vast majority of the state general fund, counting funding, and the county's population helps to induce federal funding, right? Nevada's governance institutions were not designed for a large urban and diverse metro region. Indeed, we're being essentially governed by, by people 450 miles away, right? And we have little say in how these funds get used. I know this has been a source of frustration for the folks at the county. Um, there and indeed the fact that you're doing recruiting and allowing UNR to come in and try to pick our best students up and send them up north, you know, as a UNLV for faculty member, that's a little frustrating. Um, the third point I think is a key one here, right? Current policy is ineffective in meeting the county's needs, right? So you have a situation here because of this extra revenue, right, that our county residents are being overtaxed, that is we're paying too much in property tax if it's not being sent, if it's just sitting in an account, or we're being underserved by the current programming here. Now this is not to suggest that there's no programming going on, not at all, there's a robust programming there, but I think as Shannon talked about and Fatman will talk about next, there's other opportunities there. There's also some opportunities even in Southern Nevada for, for urban agriculture. Do we have any people for, uh, what, what's that group? Urban 
Irwin Seed, right, trying to exactly develop that infrastructure there. Depending on how the Nevada voters vote in November, we may have legalized marijuana, right, another urban, I imagine there'll be quite a market for that here. Um, so you have those opportunities down there as well, just sort of thinking roughly there. So last point I want to make here before I turn it over to, to Velma is that there's also been a bit of a fight up in the legislature about protecting protecting the University of Nevada's land holdings. So a couple of bills there. Back in 1981, SB 283 was designed to make it much, much more difficult to sell off the actual physical holdings of the state farm, if you will, um, there. And then this reemerged back in the 2013 session in the form of SB 255, which was a bill carried by Pete Gokachia, who we usually associate with Elko, but actually his district picks up a little bit of Clark County because it's so big um, on that one there. And I believe, Rob, you were at that hearing. It was a quiet and I watched it, uh, the streaming. It was very, very emotional, right? And the idea here would be to protect the land grant, to not allow the regents to sell that off. The then chancellor testified against this legislation. You had some of the regents arguing against it as well in, in written testimony there. And that's where, it, where and the bill was ultimately killed in uh, Senate finance as most good policy goes to die in the Nevada legislature um, on that one there. So there's also that other issue. There's an operating issue, but there's also a fight going on about the actual physical infrastructure there um, that, that I think is useful for understanding this broader debate there. Thank you. Hello everyone, good morning. My name is Fatma Nasos. Uh, I'm a senior resident scholar at the Linz Institute and I'm also an assistant professor in the computer science department here at UNLV. Uh, today my talk is going to be about following up on Shannon's and Dave's researches uh, about a um, case research analysis that Bill, Rob and I conducted in order to understand how university cooperative extensions operate uh, and are administered in the United States. So the cooperative extension system in the nation is the, is the partnership of um, the, 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 the nation's land-grant university system with federal, uh, state and local partners. So the federal partner is the USDA overseeing the, uh, the, the whole system through uh, National Institute of Food and Agriculture and land-grant universities that are, are the actual institutions um, providing the extension services in, in, the, in the states. So Rob told you a little bit about uh, the Morale Act. And um, so 1862, 90, and 94, 1994 uh, land-grant institutions were created to take the research from the universities and sh serve it as a practical knowledge to the communities. So every state has a designated 1862 land-grant university, and some of them has 1890 and 1994 land-grant universities. So this map shows the combination of these land-grant universities in each state. Um, Nevada has only an 1862 land-grant university. Uh, states like Florida, shown in green, have um, 1890 as well. States like Alaska, shown in red, also has 1994 land-grant universities. And Oklahoma is the only state with all three types of land-grant universities. So our research <coughs> focuses on understanding the, uh, the cooperative extension run by the land grant universities. And we wanted to specifically learn about how the cooperative extension partners with universities and the faculties from those universities in their states, and uh, what kind of recruitment and fund fundraising activities they do, how the cooperative extension is funded, and whether the extension thinks that they're reaching its goals. So in order to learn more about you know, what we identified, uh, we created a set of questions and we conduct the phone and email interviews with the, uh, with the cooperative extensions in 15 states. So um, we identified initially 21 states and these states were identified based on their similarity to our state in the sense that the state's land grant university is far from the population center of the state. If you look at this list, you can see Nevada um, and Nevada's land-grant university is the University of Nevada. Uh, and the main campus of the extension, ma main office of the extension is in Reno. And Reno is um, 
261 miles away from the population center and 345 miles away from the largest city. Now you might say, oh, stop right there. It's Reno is actually 400 miles away. Um, if you're driving, yes, but these are geographical distances, so they're just a little different. So as you can see, uh, as a state, Nevada leads in both categories. Um, so just like it was mentioned before, uh, the extension services in some sense are being you know, um, phoned in 400 miles away. So um, these are the states that are included in our study. Some of them uh, did phone interviews with us. Some of them gave our, their responses via email. And this is the entire list of the university extensions that we talk. I'm showing this list, but just so you can see the differences in naming. Uh, some of them are called cooperative extensions. Some of them are called extension. Um, most of them uh, are named after the university, uh, except in Maryland, where the cooperative extension is named after the state. OK, so I'd like to give you a little bit of characteristics about these land-grant universities. Um, out of the 15 that are included in the, uni in, the, um, in the study, only one is a private university, which is Cornell. Two are state systems, which are California and Nevada. And uh, all the others are public universities. Um, exactly two thirds are Carnegie R1, and um, one third is Carnegie R2. Both of you, you know, Nevada's universities are in the R2 category. OK, so I told you about what we wanted to learn um, you know, from our study. And so we asked questions accordingly. And then we got a diversity of answers and quotes and responses from these cooperative extensions. So I would like to just, you know, there's so many more, but I would like to just give you um, an example of what these systems, cooperative extensions, told us. So one good example is the extension in Missouri. Um, the University of Missouri Extension works with their sister campuses in Rolla, Kansas City, and, um, and St. Louis in order to go after federal funds and, and grants to create business and economic de development program to, um, to benefit the entire city. They collaborate with four-year institutions as well as two-year institutions on that. Another example is Maine Cooperative Extensions. They're doing a uh, variety of uh, collaboration. One of them is having a fac shared faculty appointment. Another one is having their actual uh, extension office on the campus of another sister institution. And they also you know, cooperate with, partner with 50 other institutions. And they, um, they partner in the hunger dialogue to address food security issues in Maine. Another good example is the Iowa State University Extension. Uh, they're part of this statewide initiative called the Healthy State. Um, they're a partner on that. Their other partners include other universities, Department of Human Services, and local foundations. Again, Maryland Cooperative Extension has urban collaborations as well as agricultural collaborations. They collaborate with their sister um, universities in Baltimore and Eastern Shore in agriculture law. They also cooperate with, partner with, universities out of state on a variety of issues. And University of Nevada's cooperative extension response to the same question was, not, um, was, was general. So we followed up, just like we did with the others, and uh, when there was a gen generic answer. And uh, upon follow-up, we weren't given any examples of specific collaboration or partnership going on uh, with the UNLV faculty. Next, we ask questions about student recruitment and, and fundraising. So um, the emerging team that came up you know, with, from, from these responses were that the university extensions do not want to turn down when a faculty comes in, when a student comes in or a family comes in, and they want to learn more about the university. So they engage them in conversation, they answer their questions, but they do not really do um, formal student recruitment. And that was the case with Cornell University. Um, they don't do any you know, formal <coughs> student recruitment, but they said they have a really strong 4-H program. So when the students are 
um, enrolled in that program, when they start working with it, they learn more about Cornell and they want to, they want to apply. And they do not do any fundraising for the Cornell universities out of the extension offices. They only do it for the county level organization. Uh, University of Massachusetts was very clear cut about it. They said no fundraising, no student recruitment, not any type of central university function is done at the extension office. University of Florida Extension was similar. Again, they don't do student recruitment, but they have faculty in the extension offices and they don't turn away any you know, students or fa families when they want to learn about, um, about the programs. And the extension faculty works on you know, finding partners within, um, within other universities in the system or within uh, the community in order to go after you know, grants and contracts, but they're not looking for donors. And the Missouri Extension doesn't do any kind of student recruitment, um, and their fundraising is coordinated through the Vice Provost for Extension and the university itself. Um, <coughs> same with California, no formal student recruitment is done, but they have been discussing it because they have some counties where the county uh, extension office is the only contact with the student and the university itself. So they're trying to to, ser to serve the students um, by, by you know, helping them in that area. Again, they do not do any fundraising for the campuses of the university. If any fundraising is done within the extension, it is just to you know, benefit <coughs> the locals. Um, again, we did not get a very um, uh, clear answer on that question from the you know, Nevada Cooperative Extension, um, but now we know from days of research uh, that UNR's entire Southern Office for Recruitment is housed in the you know, University of Nevada Co-op Extension building. Okay, next we asked about how these extensions are funded. And here's a list of all the, um, the funding sources that the extension gets. So there are federal appropriations, state appropriations, federal stand, state grants and contracts, local funds, gifts and donations, and fees for service. So the general um, findings of these questions were all co corporate extensions receive federal and uh, state appropriations, and they also receive grants and contracts from federal and state sources. Uh, our study found out that Cornell, Missouri, and Maine extensions are the only three in our study that receive a comprehensive funding, which means they receive funds from all these sources. And Alaska and Massachusetts extensions do not receive any local funds. And uh, finally, we asked them about what they think ab about the, the extension meeting its goals. And overall, the executives think that the extension is meeting its goals. But almost all of them said, um, we can do more. Whatever we're doing, we're doing it good, but we want to do more of it. Uh, but we have challenges. Challenges include decreased funding and the, the changing population you know, becoming more urbanized. So what are our conclusions from our study? Um, our biggest takeaway from our study is that m in many states that are included in our research, the, the faculty at the urban branches of the, uh, of the land grant universities are included as partners, which are equal and full partners in a lot of extension projects and programs that the Langen University does. Um, examples are Missouri, Florida, California. I haven't given you all the examples, but California works with um, uh, Fresno State. It works with uh, UC Santa Barbara, UC, <coughs> UC Santa Cruz, UC Barbara. And um, Missouri works with St. Louis, Kansas City, Rolla. Um, University of Florida works with University of Central Florida, University of Miami, uh, uh, Florida International University, although they're private universities. So the university faculty in those urban branches are really immersed into the cooperative extension services provided by those extensions. Now, um, let's think about a minute here and then 
imagine what it would mean for us if we had the same model right here in Nevada. It would mean that the faculty right here on this campus, uh, and you can tell from Shannon's research, like, who are already very connected within the community, uh, would have the opportunity to be a part of the extension, right, COP extension, and work on projects that are the extension, the, the work on projects that are extension projects and programs that uh, serve the community. But we don't have that opportunity because we do not have that model in Nevada. Um, so again, with student recruitment and fundraising, um, the same theme emerged. And the corporate extensions really want to help the, uh, the community in terms of helping the students understand and know more about the, the university. But they're not doing this as, as on a formal basis as UNR does here in um, Southern Nevada. Um, about the funding, corporate extensions are funded through a variety of sources and um, federal and state appropriations and federal and state grants and contracts are common with all of them. And finally, corporate extensions meet their goals, but they face challenges, which is decreased funding and um, uh, urban populations. Now, I haven't so shown you any slides on this, but when we ask these questions, the quotes from cooperative extensions, they're really high performing. There are um, Carnegie One universities like California, Rutgers, uh, Florida. They all said, I think we're doing good, but we could do better. We want to reach out to more urban populations. We wish just we had more so that we could do more. In Nevada, we have more, so we should do more. So that's it. Thanks. Okay, they've made me, in an academic sense, I'm now the discussant. <laughs> this is a, a panel, Bill's a panel manager. I, I'll make these remarks, and I have to go give another talk with another PowerPoint, because <laughs> apparently I'm wedded on the stadium, and you know, people have no opinion on that. That's an easy one <laughs> to talk about. So, uh, you know, a discussant typically goes and makes a comment on each of the papers presented, and we've had different research presented, and I want to thank Shannon again for coming. And I like this uh, research when it was done, and the purpose of that research, just to give you a context, is when Lindsay started up, uh, we asked around and said, what is the landscape for nonprofits? We want to be effective by understanding the, the sort of who to access, who to leverage off of, because even though we were in a university, we were startup within the, uh, within the university, we were a new organization. So I commissioned that work in order to have a framework for knowing who to participate with and you know, target. And we did, we used that as a sort of a touchstone for a lot of the sort of relationships we've built. And you know, if you look at Ramona Denby, who'd love to have been here today, she's a heavy outreach faculty member, a full professor in the program with me. She's in New York, being the indispensable faculty member she is at a national conference. Uh, you know, a lot of the, uh, the sort of relationships she's done, and she does extensive work uh, in the community, were informed by some of the work that Shannon did. So this was a very useful uh, research project for us because you know, mostly you're just guessing this stuff. And we didn't, we didn't have to guess. You know? The way to proceed, and again, this is kind of a nerdy academic way to proceed, is you know, I asked a very technical question and it got addressed in that, in that research and addressed well. Uh, the good news for the community is that you know, UNLV has not really been given the charge to be a land grant, even though it is a land grant. It's not really been given the charge from senior folks within you know, the administration to, to create this level of engagement, but it's here. It's nonetheless done that, in other words. I never took it seriously. I wasn't, when I was told, you know, your, your reach extends you know, on the campus and look out over Maryland Parkway and you know, that's some sort of alien turf that I just have to commute through on my way to my little principality here. I, I was like, but a donor gave me a lot of money, you know, they're not expecting me to stay on campus, uh, they, you know, want me to get out, and if I do stay on campus, I think they're going to be pretty upset. So, you know, the, the faculty, obviously, and you see it demonstrated here, you know, are regular state U faculty, and you, know, you notice that CSN is in that connection, that Nevada State, I mean, I think the three institutions in Southern Nevada ought to work much more explicitly and much more in common with co-op extension. 
And that means not, hey, isn't it neat that we came over to your building? It means we're in sponsored projects together. In fact, we'd help with sponsored projects because we could leverage more money because the faculty here are you know, able to add to the faculty presence to the system in general. And again, are we, are we you know, by statute, are we qualified? Of course we are, we're land grant. You know, so says the Attorney General. Don't take my word, I didn't just spitball that. That's the Attorney General, and we're co-equals. So what we're doing is underperforming compared to some other states where what we're talking about with faculty, meaning that somebody is on a sponsored project and they're bought out of a class, that they're using that time to go and fix a problem or to create a program that fixes a problem or to create, you know, for example, in my area, the stuff I was doing in economic development is perfect for that. It's, it's A&M, ag and mechanical. You know, the mechanical side was not only did you need to help states out with their, with their you know, agriculture and with their productivity in that sector, you also had industry emerging in the late 19th century that was getting increasingly more technical and needed the universities as a sort of research center to understand new technology, to understand best man managerial practices, whatever, to understand opportunity. And that's exactly what the university did when the state asked me, and I thought I was being asked as a university faculty member, to look into what are the best opportunities going forward for the sector analysis, you know, which, which area should the state target, green tech, you know, uh, the sort of stuff that we're talking about with uh, Urban Seed here is perfect for this region. It's stingy on water use, high yielding, it's locally sourced food that could be connected to, uh, to, the, to the hotel industry, which is our leading sector, which is tourism. And, you know, it, it's perfect in the sense it also enhances the reputation of this region for sustainability. One of the knocks against Vegas is, you know, how dare Vegas exist? How dare it be there? You know, even though it's called the Meadows and it implies that it was, you know, founded in a place that was sort of water rich, which it was, that's why it's the Meadows. Uh, you know, there's sort of this delegitimizing effort at Las Vegas. These are perfect companies to come in to show that technology, that innovation, that university partnerships, that w this is exactly what the university needs to be doing. It needs to make sure that this is better because of the presence and the public investment of a university. And I think that you know, Shannon's work captures nicely the existing opportunities that we've gotten. You know, we're proud that we've connected. We could do more. We could do better. Uh, the paper by Dave, the research by Dave is interesting. So you know, Dave is obviously a budget nerd. I don't know what kind of sleep Dave's getting. I'm suspecting he's, it's insufficient. <laughs> I imagine Dave's house, him with the laptop and the wife. What are you looking at? And the, you know, the gold mine that is Nevada's strange governance keeps producing more you know, uh, sort of subject area for Dave. Good for you, Dave. And you know, it's, it's important to understand that the, the key partner is the locality here. In other words, most of the resources are provided to uh, you know, this co-op education, uh, co-op extension rather, to, you know, from the county. The county is, you know, if you take just, notice how rich the county is? One penny of 100 gets all kinds of money out. Like so much money that you're buying down the building. Instead of buying down the building, instead of just putting you know, $13 million in a rolling account, you know, that would be great spent on, I don't know, uh, urban seeds sort of problems, for example. It would be great to be spent on economic development, workforce, some of the other areas that we just haven't been developing. And you know, the good news is, again, I said in, in my slide presentation, it's not a zero-sum game. Because it's not that we should stop doing what we're doing. We're not suggesting that. We, you know, perfectly fine to have 4-H and all these other things that co-op does. It's that other states seem to have attached a lot more programmatic investment, a lot more faculty time, a lot more local engagement. If you've got a state university branch that has equal status and active faculty in community, use them. Use them. That's who you want to access. That's who you want to work with. Why would you have a branch in Southern Nevada? Why, why put a university down here? Why bother? If you're not, and that was one of the questions I raised early on. I was like, geez, I, I thought the sort of there was a big enough part of the state in that it constituted three quarters of the population and 80% of the revenue generated that that warranted a kind of public investment within a university because universities do good things. Universities have public virtue. That's why they get public money. 
because they fix things, they improve things, they reform things, they point to problems, they point to solutions. And you're gonna tell me that all of this down here is an academic exercise, that we're all supposed to be English lit, that's perfectly fine, kids need to write better, by the way. Anyone's from my classes, I'm watching you. But we also need the faculty doing things, you know, outside in the community. And Dave's research is interesting because, you know, again, mo mostly you think, wow, these things are running deficits. These things are working on a, you know, on a hand. We're actually well funded because Clark is affluent and its real estate's valuable. I think probably the biggest payer to ag extension, I mean to, uh, to co-op extension in the state has got to be MGM. It's the largest property holder. Would that be your assessment? Yeah, they claim a quarter of the entire general fund. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> so I'm guessing that, you know, MGM has, as a partner, and, uh, you know, full disclosure here, they've been generous with us, uh, and with the university, certainly, and they're, and they're a great partner, and very civic-minded, and very civically engaged. You know, coming, coming to corporations like that, knowing that they've made this public investment, and doing right by that public investment. This is not an inconsequential amount of resource. There, this is the envy of other states. There are states that wish they had it funded like this. There are states that have no local funding, for example. And then finally, on Fatma's piece, you know, we did this uh, analysis, and she did the vast majority of it. She credits me and Bill with helping, but it's really, it's her piece. And, you know, she suggested, and I thought this was a good idea, why not a review of best practices? You know, why not just look at the structure of this and came up with a model which is, you know, is it, is it common that if co-op extension is at some spatial distance that's pretty significant, that it then works with local partners to, to execute in a big city, especially, so, you know, Cornell, Ithaca, anyone been to Ithaca? The booming metropolis of Ithaca. <laughs> lovely, the gorge is lovely. Beautiful. Yeah, and then it, all of a sudden the weather changes and you want to get out of there, <laughs> okay. But, you know, obviously uh, there's a big state of New York out there that needs a lot of service, and they've, and they've done that. And so, you know, we were looking at models for places that had this, again, a, a fairly remote university to the main population within the state to understand how it is that in the case of a Missouri or Rutgers, you know, and I remember the model from Rutgers, I remember that uh, ocean spray, whatever the citrus, I mean, the uh, cranberry bog in Vineland, New Jersey, the ag station, uh, and I was at Virginia Tech and I remember this as well, that, you know, that you're in all these counties, you're in all these spaces, and that you also don't forget the most important thing, which is the urban counties, the urban spaces, because they have social service needs, they have economic development needs, they have even some specialized ag needs, and they're not the same ag needs that you have in rural areas. And so St. Louis has that, and Newark has that, you know, and places around the country that have that, have these universities have a, a sort of, you know, subspecialty and emphasis in urban extension. In, in this is an urban research university, and so our role in something like that is that, you know, UNLV is not interested in what happens in White Pine. It is not interested in what happens in, you know, Battle Mountain or wherever, Winnemucca. But UNLV is interested certainly in the southern section of Nevada that it is placed in, and it is especially interested in the, the fact that is a large, diverse, complex, uh, successful, vibrant place, but nonetheless has a series of accumulating dysfunctions that you know, range from everything from language acquisition for somebody who doesn't speak English proficiently, all the way to the technical problems of how to use as little water as possible to, to grow crops, to do, to do all that. And there are competencies here. There are people who are skilled and have the, uh, the sort of public priority as part of their university professorships. You know, and, he, and it's a privilege to be a faculty member. And I, you know, I think that genuinely, that it, you're lucky to be a faculty member. It's a great job. It's wonderful to be a professor. You, you owe something back because of the privilege to be a professor. Legitimately owe something back to society. Society's indulged you. It's allowed you to find a very creative field, one with immense satisfaction and personal expression. And for that, in that exchange, I know this faculty wants the best for this community. It wants to make it the best possible place it could be. It wants to engage as constructively as it can. It doesn't want to lecture. It wants to learn. It wants to understand. It wants to look at this community and, and understand not the things we think theoretically it needs, 
We got plenty of notions on that. But what we hear back, what we hear from the community, that they think they need, that they think they have help, that they need help in, that they need assistance in, and I think that Fatma captures nicely the fact that, you know, a lot of states who are doing this, it's interesting, the states that are very high performing have the greatest degree of frustration, that came out of the data, because they're like, we could do more. Well, guess what? We could do more as well. And then I'll turn it over to Bill, who's going to do Q&A, and I thank you. I'm the discussant, my discussant rolls over. <laughs> and then these, the three researchers are available to answer questions specifically to their work. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thanks, all of you. We've kept you in your seats for almost two hours. You've been very patient. We're going to take some questions now. I'm going to ask uh, that you indulge me and we play our version of Jeopardy here. Could your question actually be in the form of a question? <laughs> uh, so just throw your hand up and I will find you, sir, in the middle here. Yeah. I wondered. Uh, Well, let me take, can I answer that for you? If, but please chime in. Uh, as I mentioned at the start, uh, Shannon's paper as a brief is published and on our website and circulated and available. FATMA's is, will be, will incorporate what's said and, and engaged here and we'll have her brief put out. The event as you see it will be up and on the website as will all the PowerPoint presentations. So we announce and circulate our work through all the public and social media outlets we can. We'll, uh, if you have any suggestions as how we can better do that, we'd love to hear that. Sure, I do. I am um, the Dean of Cooperative Extension, uh, University of Nevada, and uh, with actually 10 years of experience as an extension person at Cornell University. Uh, I find these, uh, these, uh, these uh, discussions to be actually very helpful and very interesting. I think the uh, recommendations that came from Dr. Manad are very encouraging and, uh, and I think good to consider. Um, I, I do think though that just to correct a couple of impressions that may have been left, uh, University of Nevada Cooperative Extension in any county, and that includes especially Clark County, has never closed the door to any researchers. So I don't believe there are any barriers that exist to having faculty, and we have some here today who are part of this audience, to having faculty members participate in the Cooperative Extension's programs. In fact, we would welcome that. Uh, I think that's a, 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 you know, a, a, an important point that uh, seems to be um, perhaps one of the major premises is that there's not an opportunity to work with uh, cooperative extension, but there is. So I, I, I hope people don't walk away with that impression. Another Thank thing, you. Okay, just get this over to people who come back to be here. Okay. Sir, okay. Yeah, um, my question is basically about what I didn't see in this presentation is how much pinup demand there is in the rurals to really network with urban setting. And I say that based upon the last three days I just spent at the Western Nevada Development District's Economic Development Conference on the <coughs> Agrihood Tract. Um, and I talked with Dean Payne, I talked with Sarah Adler, USDA, I talked with, I, I saw in those three days from the Brownfields EPA pre-conference as well as the Agrihood Tract, I didn't see anybody else in that audience from Nevada, from, from, from Southern Nevada. And I met people from Fernley, from Winnemucca, from you know, all across the, the rurals that I, I got inundated with business cards when I mentioned that I had some familiarity <coughs> with what's going on here in, in Southern Nevada. And so I think this goes both ways, and I can, I can attest just how, you know, there are large projects in Winnemucca, for example, in, in it, with the same kinds of agriculture that could apply here, that are looking at huge foreign investment. And I didn't, so, uh, so, that, so my question is why wasn't that uh, focused on this as well? Anyone want to try that? Shannon, does your research, in terms of reaching out to rurals, your, your research was on southern Nevada. Yeah, so remember that this study was never intended to be an analysis of cooperative extension or UNLV. The study that I spoke on today was intended to be um, identifying and describing the network of health, education, and social service nonprofit organizations in southern Nevada. And so it wasn't a statewide project. And, but one of the things that we identified was within southern Nevada, UNLV is connected to the most. 
health edu as, it, as it well should be. And I would imagine that within Northern Nevada, UNR would be connected to the most health education and social service organizations. But the, the point that came out of this for me was that despite the fact that that Cooperative Extension has an office here in Southern Nevada, most other organizations either don't know that that office exists or if they do know it exists, they're not identifying them as somebody with whom they partner. So it's not just about partnership with UNLV and the faculty, as the, as the dean just noted, which I, I think is, is it's a good point to say and to encourage faculty here to, to collaborate, but that it's the health education and social service nonprofits within Southern Nevada that are not identifying Cooperative Extension as a partner for some reason. I just, just to respond really quickly, I, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with any of that, and matter of fact, I'm just saying I was pleasantly surprised at how much interest there is in urban agriculture in the rural, um, in here in Nevada, and how much we can become a center of excellence for urban food production here in Southern Nevada. There's a much more emphasis on water smart entrepreneurship and innovation and technology than on food production. Mm -hmm. And the rurals know about food production better and the consequences in urban and rural settings. So it's an opportunity, it's not really a liability. The opportunity is what I want to focus on is if, if something from this meeting can go forward and make that happen, then we've been successful, I see, right? I got plenty of cards of people that <laughs> right? just within the last three days in Reno that so, want to reach out to people here. Terrific. Ma'am? I represent a nonprofit that's on your map, and we, um, we collaborate yeah. with Women LV as well as the Cooperative Extension. But my message is I heard loud and clear that UNLV wants to help and that you have put together all this information. So my question is, I understand that Nevada has for the last 48 years been 50th in terms of getting federal funding. So from a small nonprofit, you're, you're extending your help. The help I need is for the university to work to bring to the Nevada State Legislature policy that will enable us to get some of those grants so that the organization that you can put together in Southern Nevada can actually serve the families in the community. And if you can indulge me, I have one more comment, and that is the spirit of the what I saw in the historical beginning of the land grant was about equality and about education equality for everybody. As you know, we have a lot of minorities these days in our community who need that equality. So I'm wondering why we don't have more programs at the university to support the, I hear about students couch surfing and about people coming back to school as non-traditional students because they have <coughs> to support their family. It seems like we could have programs to support those people who are struggling to do their best to end poverty and support their families. David, you want to reply? Yeah, I just want to respond to your point real quickly about grants and grant writers. That's always been Nevada's sort of, uh, was it penny, penny wise, found pound foolish, right? That is that they've been hesitant to fund grant writing positions. Um, hard to you know, in their view, it's hard to justify that, but we know that that's one of the things that across the board, every agency, we do very poorly in because they just don't have the infrastructure to do that. Um, we're developing that on campus now as our push for top tier. Um, that's a big part of it there, but it's, it's something that's been pretty Nevada, <laughs> a big problem in Nevada for a very, very long time, and it really hinders, and that's why we end up at the bottom of those lists. Let me just add one point is that uh, some of our Lindsay Brookings studies have detailed where, more specifically where and how much we uh, receive from the federal government less than peer states. And the state has been responsive in the sense of it's established a commission that now is looking at the federal state relationships, is reaching out to state agencies and is, is paying attention to that. Hopefully it will actually yield some tangible results in the near future. Sir? Uh, hello, um, my name is Michael Theodore. Um, I'm a master's in higher education student um, at the School of Education. And um, my question is this. You mentioned the push for tier one status um, that the universities um, trying to accomplish. 
I think it's a worthy accomplishment, a um, worthy goal to try to do, and I think it's necessary as well. And my question is this. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> um, with the fact that in some quarters we're not recognized as a land-grant university within the state, how much does that impact or impede um, this university becoming tier one? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, uh, my data showed that uh, of the 51 1862 land grant universities within the 50 states and DC, exactly two thirds are um, tier one universities. Those are Carnegie or one. So you can see the, the, the universities that are doing this are, uh, are, are in that category. And the same thing was implied, projected in, my, in this, on this study we had as well with the 15 universities, exactly two thirds were R1. So you see um, the, the universities providing the extension services being in the, uh, the R1 category more than the rest of the, the universities in general. So if, just one sec. So if I understood your question, let me respond to say that this, this is a big issue for the university, right? And federal funding we were just talking about. So if we've, from our point of view, we've seen multiple legal and legislative reinforcements that we are, UNLV is a part of the land grant system here in Nevada. So a recent confusion from between ENSHI and UNLV that that might not be the case has put in flux, if you will, for faculty members at UNLV, UNLV's land grant status. They can't, they, they, they are not gonna check on a box that we are a land grant university if there's a question of that, you don't want to be accused as a grant researcher of misrepresenting yourself and your university, which makes you less competitive for the, all this federal funding that we are already behind the curve at. So it's something we hope can get finally, finally, finally resolved very quickly. I'm going to go to the back and then here, if we have time. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I was curious, Shannon. Uh, one thing, I'm Angela O'Callaghan. I'm cooperative extension faculty. And I'm also adjunct in the College of Science of UNLV. But my question is, knowing how many people in Southern Nevada will say UNLV's cooperative extension, and I'm telling you right now, an enormous number of people are convinced that when they're working with extension, they're working with UNLV. So I would wonder about the accuracy of the recession of the, the regression data when you can't, if you can't separate out, are you UN, working with UNLV or are you working with cooperative extension? Because if you're working with cooperative extension, well, I'm working with UNLV. You see my question here? So were you able to factor that in? And if not, how? Can that be amended so we actually know? You see what my, my point yeah, yeah. here? No, I hear you. And um, so, does you so does cooperative extension within Southern Nevada have UNLV in its title? I guess that would be my question. We are the University of Nevada mm -hmm. cooperative, extension. cooperative extension. It doesn't say Reno. Right. It, it doesn't, doesn't say, say Nevada State right. College. It doesn't say Pershing County. Yeah. It is University of Nevada. So when, when folks on the survey put University of Nevada or Cooperative Extension, they were put in the Cooperative Extension box. When folks put UNLV, they were put in the UNLV box. And I have to be honest, I don't think a lot of folks in the community, the, the executive directors who are completing this, would conflate UNLV and Cooperative Extension together. Well, um, I just wanted to say, um, and I, I have to disagree um, slightly because the Cooperative Extension website, for example, is hosted by UNR. Right. So it's, you, you know, that, so if you drive by the building, which I've been there many times, there's a big blue N, that I don't think of UNLV. So um, I, to me, I guess I want to know what we can do. Um, you know, I, I hope to be in the legislature um, is that something, do you think that a BDR uh, or something to actually solve this once and for all, or what, I mean, what do we do? <laughs> a suggestion that we go to the legislature for a solution. <laughs> David, I'm turning that one over to you. Um, you know, 
know, certainly you could you could put that in in statute. What in define that a little bit more 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 closely um, on that. And obviously that might be given the we're hearing this would be the higher ed se you know um, session. There's a lot of B BDRs already out there. You know, this would be something I think you know for the legislature to take out and just sort of get the structure right. Um, and that that would certainly be part of it. Um, you know, the problem we have is when you read the, the statute, it conflates everything together. NCHI, the community colleges, DRI, UNR, you know, the, the single legal entity doesn't recognizing the differences in, 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 in scope of what they're doing, doesn't, so that would be very, very helpful, yes. Can I, can I just say one thing? You know, most people don't know me. I'm probably the only living regent was on the board in 68. Although maybe Proctor Hug, I think Proctor Hug. But the fact is, I've served for over 60 years as a state senator or congressman. And right now I'm chairman of the Board of Governors of the United States Postal System. I fought this battle since I, fought, I formed the UNLV Alumni Association. I came back from law school, we have no association. I was the first UNLV of, uh, uh, alumni, not a graduate, because I couldn't graduate here. Until, you know, I, I graduated in 62. Yeah. But this is a battle. The battle we're facing up in the legislature. I have been kicked around by Bill Raggio for 50 years. Now, Bill's died, and I respect him because he beat my ass many times. <laughs> the fact was that what they're saying, how Bill took the money from corporate, corporate extension and rolled it into the administration for UNR. That's just one example. What I see about the corporate extension people here, this should be the UNLV cooperative extension part of the program. Every one of you should be working that building should be a UNLV building, and we should be, you should be UNLV staffers. And the fact is part of our program. They shouldn't be recruiting for UNR. And, I, and a lot of people from, kids from here go to UNR because they like going up north. But this battle is gonna be tough up there. You know the fact they're changing it. And, and the fact is, I'm, most, I, I'm just so glad that somebody's even talking about it because it didn't. the way they, they ran over us in the legislature, all the northern legislators, whether they were Democrats or Republicans, went along with Rashid. And he picked up the Republicans from the South. So we were trying to win this battle for years and years and years. I'm hoping that the question is, how can we win this battle? I understand BDRs are great, but we have to have people unified for the community colleges, too. These people are getting screwed over the community colleges badly. I mean, you hear the stories about them looking at Kingman and Barstow to be training people for the new projects out here at Apex because we're so into bureaucracy that we don't get to we don't get the people trained. I mean, it's frustrating for me for 60 years to serve in office, either appointed or elected, and to see the same battle going on that was going back when I was elected to the state senate in 1980 or the regents in 1968. I'm an old man. Somebody get on the ball. My daughter wants to run here, and she's won the Democrats. She's going to be there. But the fact is, it's a, it's a terrible, hard battle. But if we don't stick together at UNLV, you know, we have a huge alumni that have graduated. 4,000 belong to the Alumni Association. We should have 40,000 Alumni Association. Every one of those people should be writing their, con their assemblyman, their regent, to support us in this battle. Because believe me, even Southern Nevada legislators, Southern Nevada regents, are not there when we need them most of the time. And, and I am sick and tired of it, but I only have a few more years probably, but the fact was, please win this battle before I, I go to the next reward. Uh, we're not gonna end on that note. <laughs> Let me, oh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, please. My name is Sylvia Lassos. I am a UNLV law professor. I had the honor <coughs> of serving at the University of Missouri where extension really does work extremely well. Uh, it does not work well here, Mark. You know, we've had this conversation. I'll say a couple things. First of all, when Missouri tried to cut uh, university funds and extension funds, people from every county in Missouri rose up in anger because they recognized the value of extension in a well-functioning system. So there's an added aspect that I don't think has been mentioned, is that this builds up an enormous amount of goodwill for the university system as a whole when cooperative works the way that it should. And I'll beg to differ with you, Mark. I mean, I think there one crucial thing that I experienced at Missouri that I have never experienced here is the fact that cooperative faculty were on the campus. 
I didn't have to get into the car and go on, on the highway to go talk to a cooperative pers uh, extension person. And the other thing is they all had PhDs. You know, so we were able to be academic pointy heads one to another on campus when we're talking about joint uh, projects. My own cooperative extension project is called Cambio de Colores. It is an extension monograph that is still on the uh, website, one of their best publications, not just because I wrote it, it was because of what I was interested in, which was demographic immigrant change and how you integrate immigrants into the community when you have rapid uh, changes. Now, Missouri Extension took the lead on that. Has Extension here in Nevada taken the lead on demographic change? No, it has not. And that is disappointing and a loss not only to the university, but a loss to the community as a whole. Finally, I'm a lot more positive than uh, the gentleman here, I didn't catch your name, about the possibility, oh, Mr. Bilbrey, okay. Uh, about the possibility of change this session. Everything that I hear is that there will be an ENCHI breakup bill. Now, whether that bill will be successful or not, it, you know, it depends. But certainly that is the train to get on. Stephen Silverkraus is carrying that bill, a Republican. His best, best buddy, David Gardner, got the CCSD breakup bill going and everybody said that would never happen. And it did happen, it's law. So Enchi breakup bill will happen next, um, uh, next time around. I think we can get on the uh, bandwagon, talk about how to uh, get extension. You know, I don't know if it's a breakup, but it's, you know, Mark comes down from Reno to supervise extension. I think that's a little bit wrong. I think we should have our own people here uh, that are looking at the Southern interest and can create the kinds of partnerships uh, that would make the state better, Southern Nevada better, and inchy better as a whole. Thank you. Let me just, as we conclude, thank you, please. Uh, let me say that uh, thank you for attending, obviously, and for your engagement. Let's continue this discussion. Uh, continue it with your colleagues, your peers, your friends, your legislators, if you care to, whomever you think can be a part of bringing better public policy to Southern Nevada and by extension if I can use that word, <laughs> the state. Uh, our speakers will be here if you, if you have a question that we weren't able to get to in our time. I'm committed to get you out of here and it's only five minutes late, so forgive me for that. But thanks again for coming and we'll see you at our next event. <laughs>